Good morning and good afternoon to our friends in Europe. My name is Alina Polyakova. I'm president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis based in Washington, DC. I join you today on an important day. Today marks the anniversary of Victory Day in Europe. And it's important to take this moment to remember our common history and our common struggle that followed in the years after the end of the war in 1945. But as the living memory fades, it's also an opportunity to recall the truth of that historical moment and then the years that followed. One of Russia's longest disinformation campaigns has been the attempt to rewrite the history of World War II, including the role of the Soviet Union and the history of the post-war years in Central and Eastern Europe. Ukraine, Lithuania, Poland, and other countries that found themselves part of the East Bloc all suffered under Soviet rule following World War II. I'm honored to be able to host this discussion today to shed light on the truth of post-World War II history and to focus on the strides these countries have made to overcome this past. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you today to this discussion with the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Volodymyr Yelchenko, the Polish ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Piotr Wilczek, and the Lithuanian ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Rolandas Krishunas. There will be time for questions at the end. So I encourage all of you following on Zoom or watching on YouTube and Twitter on Zoom, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. If you're following along on Twitter at SIPA or on YouTube, uh, please tweet at us at our SIPA handle at SIPA and we'll try to pull in your questions as much as we can as well. So now without further, further ado, uh, let me open by welcoming Ambassadors Yelchenko, Vilcek and Krishnas. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I can imagine there is a lot on your plate and I am grateful for the time you're taking for this discussion. So without further ado, let me get uh, right to the conversation. For many countries in Europe, allied victory over the Nazis brought peace and freedom, uh, but that was certainly not the case uh, for much of Central and Eastern Europe. For millions of people, Soviet occupation meant continued oppression. Uh, Ambassador Wilczek, uh, let me start with you. In Poland, the Soviet Union did not immediately dispense uh, with at least the outward forms of, of, of uh, self-determination. Um, and but, but this obviously didn't last uh, very long. Uh, Soviet hegemony became apparent and uh, as the government became increasingly more oppressive and restrictive in the decades that followed. Ambassador Wilczek, can you briefly comment on the Polish experience in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War? Uh, to the countries east of the Iron Curtain, uh, the Soviet Union imposed the communist political and economic regime, depriving them of freedom, sovereignty, and an efficient economic system based on market economy. Uh, unfortunately, ever since 1943, after conferences in Tehran and later conferences in Yalta and others, the Western powers, including the United States and the United Kingdom, practically chose not to support the Polish government in exile. Um, there were many complicated reasons for that. Um, the Soviet Union was very successful in its campaign against Germany. And when the Soviet Union um, liberated and at the same time invaded um, Eastern Poland and later Central Poland, it installed a puppet government on the territories which were as I said, at the same time, liberated and invaded by, by the Red Army. Uh, in June 1945, uh, Polish underground leaders were arrested and transported to Moscow to face a sham trial. Uh, public opinion in the West, uh, very much influenced by the Soviet propaganda, was not fully aware of the situations, of the, of the situation. Diplomats and politicians, of course, were. So at that time, uh, thousands of the wartime resistance fight fighters were arrested. Non-communist political parties were harassed. Uh, 
the remnants of the active underground, uh, whom we call now the cursed soldiers, were searched, persecuted, and killed. And the free, unfettered elections promised at Yalta, but by the great powers, were repeatedly postponed. The country at that time was run by an NKVD officer, Bolesław Bierut, who later became president of Poland. Of course, he was imposed by Moscow. A rigged referendum held in June 1946 uh, to test the communist popularity among the general population was followed by elections that were finally held in January 1947. They were so fraudulent that even the US ambassador in Warsaw promptly resigned in protest and left Warsaw. Um, as, as we all know, Poland wasn't allowed to receive aid as uh, part of the Marshall Plan. The Soviet Union condemned the plan as a capitalist ruse. So the divide between West and East was hardened and countries in the Soviet zone, including Poland, were cast in isolation. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Ambassador Krishnas, let me take it over to you. Um, as, as many will remember, uh, of course, the Baltic states, uh, including Lithuania, uh, became an official part of the Soviet Union, unlike Poland, uh, which led to a very different experience, to say the least. The United States certainly never recognized uh, the Soviet occupation of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. But can you tell us a bit more as to what was the experience like in Lithuania um, around this historic day and in the years to follow? Well, for Lithuania and of course uh, the, the other two Baltic states, Latvia and Estonia, it meant a uh, second uh, Soviet occupation in four years. And of course, which led to 50 years of oppression, uh, being a part of Soviet Union, uh, which of course, as you duly mentioned, uh, was never recognized by most of the uh, democracies. Um, uh, so we were a captive nations after World War II. And for us, actually, even armed conflict uh, have not stopped uh, uh, on May 8, uh, because uh, the resistance, armed resistance in Lithuanian forests, uh, waging the partisan war against the Soviet occupation, actually continued uh, for more than 10 years. So it, well, it went well into 50s. When the last, it was finally crushed by Soviets and, um, and the last people were imprisoned and killed, actually executed uh, in there. So it meant uh, also, if to look at the, uh, at the numbers, it meant that uh, all in all, Lithuania lost uh, around 300,000 people to Soviet oppression. Some were killed on the spot, uh, some were sent to Siberia, some were imprisoned in gulags. Uh, in most of the cases, it meant deaths. And then, of course, uh, those figures are staggering. And tens of thousands were lo losing their lives in fighting the Soviet occupation and forests. And of course, uh, it, the resistance was crushed, uh, but it never stopped. It just changed the form. So if it was after World War II, uh, and it was armed, uh, then it became peaceful, which uh, always was there. So it was uh, never stopped it and it continued uh, for all those 50 years of occupation. Thank you, Ambassador. I think I'd like to come back to the you point to and the Ambassador Vilcek uh, noted in his uh, opening comments um, is the continued resistance movements that we saw across all the occupied uh, countries of the, the Soviet Union and the sort of so-called Eastern Bloc, um, and how all of these resistance movements remained active despite uh, the uh, incredible uh, oppression that was the consequence of keeping these resistance movements alive, um, how citizens uh, supported these resistance movements over time, and how in the end, the, this kind of uh, culture of resistance to oppression to Soviet occupation led to this uh, euphoric moment of, of freedom um, in 1989 and, and following with the fall of the Soviet Union. But let me um, uh, put a pin in that and table it for a second. Um, I want to um, 
uh, move over to you, Ambassador Yelchenko. Uh, perhaps the past doesn't feel um, as much like the past in Ukraine today, uh, of course, with Russian occupation of Ukraine's Crimea and Russia's uh, continued uh, war in Ukraine's east and the Donbass, where more than 13,000 Ukrainians have perished. Um, but I want to uh, ask you to speak about the historical moment. Uh, Ukraine, a uh, country that was uh, the largest after Russia in the, so in the former Soviet Union, uh, closest to Russia geographically, perhaps uh, linguistically as well. But what was the experience like for Ukraine uh, specifically uh, after uh, the uh, defeat of the Nazis in 1945? Thank you for the question. Uh, I would like to start by saying that, in fact, uh, the territory of Ukraine was repeatedly ravaged by the world whirlwind of the war, the Second World War, since September 1939. As the military front in Europe rolled twice over our territory, uh, even conservative estimates put the number of my parish compatriots to 8.5 million people and half of industrial potential of Ukraine was totally destroyed. Over 7 million of Ukrainians fought in the Second World War in seven armies, in particular in the Polish, French, British, Canadian, and, and, and the US armed forces. Ukrainian generals and marshals commanded the forces on more than a half of the Soviet fronts. A quarter of those mobilized to the Red Army were Ukrainians. But coming deeper into history, I, I would also say that uh, for Ukrainians, the desire for freedom and sovereignty was always a decisive value. Uh, 100th anniversary of the Ukrainian Revolution of 1917-1918 marked the restoration of the Ukrainian statehood with all its contemporary attributes, parliament, government, state symbol, uh, and others. Ukrainian fought in the Second World War, which left no Ukrainian family unaffected. But we also faced the horrors of the Stalinism, just to name the deportation of the Crimean Tatars, for example, in 1944. Unfortunately, the end of the war didn't bring freedom to my country. State terror, deportations, and, and persecutions were reinforced by the Soviet consistent policy to deprive Ukrainians of our statehood and sovereignty. But after the end of the war, Ukraine continued its fight for independence and autonomy. For example, uh, as we know, Ukraine was among UN founding states of 51 nations. And the delegation of Ukraine took active part in the founding conference in San Francisco and made a valuable contribution to the development of the UN Charter. And this, uh, let me say, silent fight continued until the end of 1991 and uh, until the referendum for Ukraine's independence. And finally, Ukraine has become an independent country. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me just, just stay with you uh, for another moment, if I may. Um, you know, it's interesting that while most of the world sees May 8th and celebrates May 8th as you know victory um, in Europe Day, uh, what you and your colleagues uh, have obviously point out is that while victory, allied victory, brought freedom to so many countries in Europe, it certainly didn't bring that freedom uh, to countries like Ukraine, uh, Poland, and Lithuania. Yet Russia today um, is celebrating uh, what is May 9th, um, while the rest of the world celebrates today as the official day of victory, Russia celebrates it tomorrow on May 9th. Uh, Ambassador Yelchenko, can you explain what is the significance of this difference and how does it reflect on the Russian view of World War II um, in what is referred to in Russia as the Great Patriotic War? Uh, well, of course, the difference is, is very significant. Uh, from the very beginning, the introduction of different dates uh, for celebrating the end of the Second World War uh, by that time, leader Stalin was aimed at the creation of its own myth of victory and also opposing itself to the democratic states. Uh, what is uh, interesting and important to note is that the role of the Western allies 
was totally depreciated. One good example, the volume of military help under the, the, the land lease uh, program that were seriously diminished in the former Soviet Union, and it continues until this day. Uh, the creeping rehabilitation of Stalin, um, a military criminal who killed millions of Ukrainians, Russians, and people of other nationalities, reinforced slogan of a great patriotic war pursues the goal to ingrain an illusory sense of national and state greatness and the restoration of the Russian Empire. Just days ago in occupied Sevastopol in Crimea, the occupation authorities uh, installed a huge banner with portraits of Stalin and Putin and the, 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 the insignia. Uh, for Putin, for Stalin. Any comment? Yeah, thank you for bringing up this uh, desire to rehabilitate uh, one of the, if not the greatest dictator the world has ever seen, who of course was Stalin, uh, who murdered millions of his own people during the Soviet period and the period of great terror, uh, even before um, the war uh, began, World War II began. Uh, and the kind of activities you describe with new commemorations, memorials, statues devoted uh, to an individual who was uh, by far one of the, mo one of the most destructive uh, forces that we've known in human history is, is quite um, shocking. Um, Ambassador uh, Wilczek, let me come back to you with, with a similar question. Um, I mentioned in my opening comments the one of the longest running disinformation campaigns uh, of Russia uh, in, in, in its desire to revise World War II history. Um, we talked about the significance of the date, May 8th versus May 9th, as it's celebrated in Russia. Um, can you respond and comment on why, from the Polish perspective, that date is significant to you, the difference in the, in the dates that we see Russia versus the rest of the world? You know, of course, as, as uh, Ambassador Yelchenko mentioned, May the 9th is the date of Soviet Victory Day, and this tradition is deliberately uh, continued and cherished in today's Russia. The, the Kremlin politics of memory largely replicates, replicates the Soviet paradigm of Russian history. Uh, the myth of the Great Patriotic War, as, as they call it, 1941-45, is... Uh, fundamental to the Russian uh, national identity. And for the Kremlin, it serves the same, I would say simplified propagandistic goals it had during, during the Soviet times. So the Soviet templates have been chosen, I think for a number of reasons. Firstly, for the USSR's close association with superpower status. Secondly, um, because they offer a set of ready-made symbols, which many Russians still cherish and find meaningful. Uh, thirdly, such a choice reflects the mentality of and serves the interests of the core beneficiaries of Putinism. Um, so the myth of the great patriotic war, including its key aspect, the 1945 victory over Nazi Germany is an instrument for legitimizing Russia's great power aspirations. So um, I would say that the, this mythology serves the current needs of Russia's foreign policy. The, the secularization of the victory in 1945 takes pride of place as a turning point that raised the Soviet Union to the status of superpower. This myth um, carries a strong I would say messianic message. It depicts the Soviet Union as a state that accomplished a unique mission of saving the world from absolute evil from Nazi Germany. So um, also the loss of over 20 million Soviet citizens, um, of course, citizens of many, many na nationalities, including Ukrainian, um, as a result of the war is exploited as a counter argument to invalidate the historical narratives of neighboring states. 
uh, asserting that in the 20th century, they were victims of Soviet imperial expansion. So the, the Russian official uh, narrative of the war is framed in almost religious terms. Any attempts to question this canonical version of events um, are stigmatized as blasphemous. So I think that May the 9th is a part of this canon. Thank you, Ambassador. I'd like to take this moment to just remind those of you who uh, are eager to ask questions, uh, either via Twitter or the Q&A, we'll try to re re incorporate your questions in the next few minutes. So please feel free um, to start asking whatever questions you may have uh, for the ambassadors. Um, I want to <clears throat> put, a, put a pin in a finer point on what you just said, Ambassador Vilcek, and what uh, Ambassador Yelchenko has also said in his previous comments. And that's this uh, rhetorical trick, if you will, uh, that we now often see in uh, you know, Russian uh, media narratives. And we've seen this for quite some time and also in official statements uh, by some Russian government officials uh, that it was uh, Russia who lost uh, 20 million uh, lives in World War II uh, in a way in, in a strange way, taking uh, credit of the credit of victimhood or bearing the mantle of victimhood, when of course, um, as Ambassador uh, Yelchenko pointed out as well, uh, a large number of those who lost their lives in the war as part of the Red Army affront on Nazi Germany uh, were Ukrainians um, as well, and Belarusians and, and, and citizens of other uh, countries uh, that now um, are not being given the kind of uh, credit, certainly not in the Russian narrative, that they deserve for those quite significant losses. Um, Ambassador uh, Krishnas, I want to take it back over to you and the Baltic experience. Um, this date that we've been talking about, May 8th, uh, the May 9th, as it's celebrated in Russia for a variety of reasons, as we just heard from Ambassador uh, Vilchek and Ambassador Yelchenko, um, takes on, I think, a different significance um, in Lithuania and, and the Baltic region more broadly. Um, Baltic governments, including Lithuania, have faced repeated attacks over uh, efforts to honor uh, 20th century liber liberation movements, which we started talking about earlier, and to condemn the Soviet occupation, which began in 19 1940. Uh, Russia has denounced these efforts, uh, labeling all such liberation groups as so-called fascists. Um, Ambassador Krishnas, in your view, what is the proper response uh, to this former Russian pressure that the Baltic states especially uh, have, been have been feeling over the years? Uh, of course, we should tell the truth, what it is. And uh, it's, it's quite understand uh, uh, understandable why Russia is using it, because uh, everyone wants to be not seen as an aggressor. Everyone wants to be seen, you know, uh, as liberator. And of course, uh, the resistance um, in Lithuania after World War II ended in Europe, uh, for the most of Europe, or for the part of Europe, uh, goes counter that narrative. So it shows, you know, that the people actually were fighting and, thousands, and tens of thousands of people, of people were dying for the independent Lithuania, uh, waging the partisan war because it was not possible to, to wage any kind of other war uh, because of mismatch of the forces in there. And a lot of people actually even chose uh, to come from uh, labor camps in Nazi Germany uh, when they were liberated to join those people in Lithuania to fight against the Soviets. And, and of course, uh, that's, uh, that goes to the counter uh, all of this presentable narrative by, uh, so, uh, by Russia that they were liberating, which actually gives them kind of a higher moral ground uh, to, to do probably a lot of things they would like to do in those countries uh, surrounding Russia, even today. And, um, and of course, what we should, we should explain uh, why. And, that, and I still find that a lot of people in the West, they don't understand this difference. And it's a pity. Uh, of course, yes, the Hollywood movies were not made yet about these uh, painful chapters of our history. Uh, I hope one day uh, there will be books are coming, actually, and one of the writers, uh, Ruta Shepetis, who is Lithuanian-American, uh, she was actually a daughter of refugee who, went, uh, who ran from Lithuania after World War II because the Soviets were coming in. 
and she's writing popular historical novels about the subject, uh, what it meant to be sent to Siberia, so that the West understands better why in Lithuania and in other Baltic states, um, Hitler and Stalin actually are being seen as a similar, as the fruits of the same evil tree. Uh, there are no liberation on the part of Soviet Union, which was done in Lithuania. As I said, 300,000 people died because, uh, or were sent to Siberia because of this occupation. And of course, uh, explaining it, it's very difficult. Uh, because uh, there's a lot of noise created even by Russia on purpose, uh, clearly on purpose because it goes against their narrative, against their glorious victory, uh, liberation, against uh, the, the narrative that they were good and pure good, uh, and Nazis were evil, even though that they found the uh, ability to sign the treaties, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, which actually incented. Uh, uh, occupation and division by Paul of Poland and the rest, and actually you could say that it it was a very big one help for the start of the World War II in general because it kind of made a deal. The Soviets and uh, and Nazis made a deal. So how one good, one bad, you know, makes a deal and uh, decides how to share the rest of the countries uh, around them. So that uh, goes against the narrative for Russia wants to propose because it's uh, they're uncomfortable for them and we should uh, in the Baltics explain this painful history to, to the rest, uh, because it's very unfair, even, especially for the people who lost their lives fighting the Soviet occupation and uh, who were oppressed and sent to Siberia. So we owe them at least that recognition of their efforts to fight the Soviets. I want to focus for a second on the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, because this particular moment, this particular uh, agreement between uh, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union at the time is also another area that modern Russia today, the Kremlin today, um, is trying to revise the narrative on. Um, just for those in our audience, of course, the Malta Ribbentrop Pact was uh, a, a secret deal signed between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, between Hitler uh, and Stalin, uh, which uh, carved up uh, Europe between the two powers, uh, Nazi Germany and, and the USSR, uh, with the ag non-aggression agreement. And that was only uh, broken when Hitler broke that initial agreement um, and, and invaded uh, what was supposed to be uh, Soviet territory. And that was when the Red Army got into the war, but not before. Uh, so we often forget that, of course, there was an alliance uh, between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany of sorts uh, before uh, the USSR entered the war on the side of the Allies. And this is a painful moment in history that, of course, Russia is very actively trying to push against that objective truth and, and reality. Um, I want to I have two more questions and then I'll, I'll take over some audience questions. Um, my Two questions. One is for Ambassador Yelchenko. And this goes back to um, the memor memorialization of the war um, in Ukraine. Um, and I'll have a similar question for you, Ambassador uh, Vilchek, about some of the atrocities committed. Um, but Ambassador Yelchenko, just this past February, so this year, uh, President Putin of Russia claimed, as he has before, uh, that Russians and Ukrainians are one people. Uh, destined for unification. Uh, this is what we heard uh, quite frequently in the Russian justification uh, behind the invasion and continued military occupation of Crimea. Ambassador Yelchenko, what can the international community do to refute this narrative and to support Ukrainian sovereignty? Yeah, uh, let me go back for a second uh, beginning of our conversation and, and recall that, uh, in fact, this narrative uh, by Putin, uh, the narrative he adores actually about one people, uh, perfectly fits to another narrative about uh, 20 or more million of, of victims of Russia in the Second World War. Uh, uh, which means that they don't really make any any difference, any separation between Russians, Ukrainians, and uh, other nations of the former Soviet Union, 
And uh, uh, I remember well that uh, while I served in Moscow as Ukraine's ambassador to the Russian Federation, I've heard the same narrative about one, one people many, many times uh, from uh, you know, officials, from ordinary people, because this is deeply rooted uh, 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 narrative. Uh, it is due to propaganda well orchestrated in Russia during at least the last 15 or more years. And, uh, you know, there is another narrative which is being uh, used uh, quite often uh, during my surf in the Russian Federation about the uh, extremely negative and destructive role Ukraine played in the in the uh, dissolution of the, the former Soviet Union back in 1991. They never blamed uh, Belarusians of Ka or Kazakhs of Georgians uh, uh, or Lithuanians. They they were used to blame to put a finger on Ukraine, because they say, look, Ukraine was the second biggest, second largest, second most powerful part of the former Soviet Union. And, and this is because of you, because of your uh, you know, negative attitude to the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, uh, I think they will continue to use the this narrative unless it is met with at least more active you know opposition uh, in the west in the neighboring countries because it looks like uh, if it is uh, totally clear uh, at least for the most of eastern europeans who are closer to russia closer to history know better the history uh, this fact is uh, more or less uh, more or less overlooked uh, 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 in the more more western countries and more distant countries, we need to, to say more about the real facts, about the history of Ukraine, about the fact that, that Ukraine as a state appeared on the map uh, uh, at least five or even seven, you know, hundred years before Russia ever started to exist, about the fact, uh, and, and uh, my dear colleague Piotr uh, 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 would agree with me that uh, for example, Ukrainian language is much closer to Polish or to virtually any other Eastern European language or regional language than, than to Russia. Although the Russians would immediately react to that, for example, saying that, look, uh, well, there is no difference between Ukrainian and Russian. But if you, uh, you know, talk to them in more detail, they would agree that, yes, uh, for them, there's no difference because they think that every Ukrainian speaks Russian. But uh, you can hardly find uh, the Russian or a Russian, you know, speaking perfectly Ukrainian, simply because uh, we studied Russian language in schools, and and they never did the same. And even today, uh, in spite of all you hear about uh, this the suppression of Ukraine uh, of Russian language in Ukraine, there are you know, dozens, if not hundreds of, of Russian schools in Ukraine, but you can hardly find more than one or two very, very small institutions uh, in the territory of the Russian Federation where you can study Ukrainian. Thank you, uh, Ambassador, for clarifying that. I have a similar question for you, uh, Ambassador Vilchek. Um, you know, Russia has also recently attempted uh, to revise the true history of the 1940 Katyn massacre. Uh, this was a horrendous event where 22,000 Polish military officers and civilians were killed uh, by the NKVD, the uh, early Soviet uh, security services. Um, a sign at the memorial entrance now reads, here rest over 8,000 Soviet and over 4,000 Polish citizens. Uh, which is an attempt to show that more Soviets uh, died there and were killed there than, than Poles. Ambassador Vilcek, what steps is your government taking to preserve the truth of Katyn specifically? And what must the international community do uh, to resist this kind of historical revisionism? Uh, Katyn is, is a symbol of the criminal policy of the Soviet system against the Polish nation. Uh, the Soviets attempted to hide the truth of the massacre for many years, and it took the Soviet Union nearly 50 years to admit to this crime. Uh, 
Finally, in 1990, uh, President Gorbachev officially admitted for the first time that the crime was committed by the NKVD. Uh, the political atmosphere started, unfortunately, to change during the President Putin's era. Now, uh, Putin's actions and words often go against the joint work of Polish and Russian historians and experts uh, and the achievements of his predecessors, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, uh, who, despite the difficult past relations uh, between our nations, tried to seek the path of truth and reconciliation in Polish-Russian relations. So although um, the Russian public uh, has become better informed about the Katyn massacre after the, a memorial was opened on the scene of the massacre, a semi-official Russian historical discourse is now rehashing the falsified Stalinist version of the event, suggesting that the Poles were massacred by, by the Germans. This is obviously, this was obviously the, the Stalinist propaganda. In 2004, the Polish Institute of National Remembrance uh, launched an investigation based on the assumption that the Katyn massacre was a war crime and a crime against humanity. But as you can imagine, um, uh, the, the investigation is ongoing, but as you can imagine, uh, the the Russian Prosecutor General Office is, is not cooperating. So we have repeatedly proposed to Russia the resumption of expert talks on difficult historical issues. Russia did not agree, and in return, we were the target of further provocations. But um, I believe we'll not give up in explaining basic historical truths to our Russian partners as long as it's as it's necessary. A fair and critical view of history instead of propaganda would pay tribute to the millions of victims of Stalinist repression, including victims on the Russian side. So let me bring in a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, General Ben Hodges uh, says, uh, congratulations to Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine for continuing your fight to protect your freedom. But what should the US and the West be doing to improve relations with Belarus and perhaps improve their chances for increased sovereignty and freedom. Of course, Belarus uh, is often called the only remaining dictatorship uh, in Europe, a country that remains unfree in so many different ways. Um, Ambassador Yelchenko, perhaps let me start with you if you wanna take that question. Well, it's a kind of a difficult question to be frank. Uh, I think the best way is probably to engage more with Belarus to, uh, you know, separate in a way the feelings and uh, the uh, opinions of the ordinary Belarusians uh, and specific, well, especially the young people about what is happening in and around their country and, and the formal position of the government of, of, of Belarus. I remember well uh, one case that was many years ago. Uh, I, I I was sitting in in Kiev airport waiting for my flight, and and there was a group of young Belarusians also waiting for the flight to some country, and they were just talking uh, to each other, and unintentionally I've heard uh, the conversation, and most of it was that like look. We're sitting uh, in, in Kiev's in the Ukrainian airport. Can you feel how different is the air? We can breathe better here. We're so happy that we left Minsk and, and we're not going to return there for at least a couple of months. They were probably aiming at some Western European country or the United States, I'm not sure. So we need to engage more with people like, like, like this. Although, uh, well, Ukraine enjoys very good relations with Belarus. We are neighbors, our languages are very close, uh, but again, it's a huge difference between uh, the official position of the government of Belarus and, and, and what the ordinary people think. Uh, more engagement, I think it, it was a good decision made, made by the US government recently to, to return to kind of normalcy, to return the US ambassador to Minsk. And uh, I think that uh, the, the more engagement between the US and uh, and Belarus, 
on formal and informal levels will be very helpful to that age. But I think that our my 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 dear colleagues, both of them, they they also bother Belarus and and they can say no less than I uh, what what they think about this. Thank you, Russell Yelchenko. I want to bring another question from our audience. Um, uh, Ambassador Krishunas, let me take it over to you. Of course, feel free uh, to respond to the question regarding Belarus as well. Uh, but I want to bring in what is a set of questions that's emerging uh, about uh, the citizens of Russia today. Um, given that Russians living in Russia now um, tend to be the number one target of their own government's disinformation and propaganda. Um, so Maria Snigovaya asks, um, the role of World War II for the Putin regime for its own legitimacy is enormous. Uh, in some ways is the founding myth of the Russian, of the modern Russian state, and in part explains anti-Western hostility uh, by Russia today. So how do we create an alternative, but still attractive vision of World War II history for the Russian population, perhaps when Putin is gone. Uh, Ambassador Krishnas, let me start with you. Uh, thank you. It's, um, it's a very deep uh, question, I would say. We could actually spend an hour talking only about this, but um, I think what is important, uh, because I think what Russia or Putin's regime does uh, today uh, trying to distort uh, the, 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 the historical truth uh, actually leaves us without closure. So we will still will not have a closure on World War II, so it always will be present. And of course, and even, and this closure is needed to Russia too. I, I understand why uh, the narrative about uh, the World War II and glory of the World War II and uh, the patriotic, the great patriotic war is so important for Putin uh, for a number of reasons. On, on one part, it clearly feeds into the narrative that the West is weak. So. If not us, you know, the Nazis probably ruled the world. Uh, so that gives an exclusive moral ground for, 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 for the Russia. On the other side, it also goes to the narrative uh, that democracy in general, we could uh, look, is, is kind of a weak system uh, because democratic countries were suffering and they would have been demolished uh, by, um, uh, by Nazis. So only the strong hand, they don't call it, we call it autocratic regime. Uh, they would call in Russia, uh, in Kremlin, that uh, it's a strong hand. Only leaders like Stalin uh, could uh, could persevere and could win against Nazis, uh, could mobilize everyone, and so on. So that's why uh, they are feeding this narrative. But it's dangerous for Russia itself because uh, it means uh, that, yeah, the distancing itself from the democracy, from the human rights, those are secondary. It's those are not important. Another important hidden message, I would say, in the, the uh, in this exclusive victory of uh, the Great Patriotic War is that uh, Russia's population is capable to huge sacrifice, tremendous, immense sacrifice. And, uh, and actually this sacrifice leads to glory. You know, so, it's, uh, so it would seem that, I don't know, maybe it also distracts attention and sends a message that we could sacrifice, but we have a high moral ground. We could dis uh, keep a blind eye that there are some deficiencies of our daily lives in Russia today because sacrifices are part of glory and then we're capable to sacrifice and we are still on the siege. The, the weak West is still somehow threatening Russia, which is contradictory narrative as you would see. The weak West and still is a threat to Russia because it's democratic West. Democratic and democracy is a threat to not Russia. Democracy is a threat to Putin's regime. And, um, uh, and we need to do everything to fight this narrative because I think in the long run, uh, it, it's also important for the Russia, ordinary Russians, because they would probably like to be respected uh, but they, they, and they would like to see why in the long run, I would guess, the Russia where the human rights, rule of law is being respected, transparency is being respected, human dignity is respected. And, uh, and I hope that one day it will come. And, uh, and of course, that also explains what's happening today, for example, and why it's so important for Russia to keep Ukraine in its own grasp. Because democratic, transparent, 
where the human rights are respected, rule of law is respected, country, Ukraine is such a, such a big threat. Because Russia will always picture the Baltic states as kind of, well, bad Nazi countries. They only suffered from the collapse of Soviet Union. And so basically brushing us off, you know, that we are democratic, developing very fast, living a better lives than uh, most uh, uh, Russians do today. But Ukraine, that would be very difficult to ignore because it's a Slavic country. It's very close, and uh, we see the narrative that it's even Putin goes as far as you know, naming it's a single nation. This is not true. So that would be very difficult to ignore and to just just brush off. You know, if Ukraine Ukrainian success, I think it's also a key uh, in the long run for the success of Russia. Mr. Krishna, thank you uh, for pointing out the hypocrisy or the the double think in some of the narratives that we see from the Kremlin and. I want to go to Ambassador Vilcek, but then I'll take it back to you, Ambassador Yilchenko, since we started talking about your country uh, just now um, and why it's so important um, in so many different ways, but particularly as uh, a country that from the Kremlin's own narrative, which states, as we were talking about, that Russia and Ukraine are one and the same. And of course, that leads us to the conclusion, well, if Ukraine uh, can prosper as a proper democracy, which it is today, and can have uh, rule of law, free and fair elections, then why can't that happen in Russia? And I think that is a existential threat to the Putin regime um, and why it has been so critical and, and, so, and at a relatively high cost, why the Kremlin has thought to attack Ukraine uh, through its uh, military aggression in Crimea and the Donbass at least because it sees Ukraine's and Ukraine's own success as a democracy, as a threat um, to the current regime in Moscow. So before I take it back over to you, I, I wanna bring Ambassador Vilcek back into the conversation um, on Russia's own trajectory. Um, there's another question uh, regarding this, uh, sort of the beyond Putin question um, and the lack of closure that the Russian people themselves have uh, on the end of the Second World War. Um, you know, growing up in Ukraine myself, uh, back in the Soviet era, I always felt like World War II had just happened yesterday. Um, and then when I moved to the United States and my family immigrated, uh, I realized that for most of my American friends, uh, World War II was something deep, deep, deep in the past. Um, and that was a big shock to me um, as, as a child uh, moving from the Soviet Union to the United States. Um, but I want to ask you, uh, Ambassador Vilcek, uh, will Russia still partially be stuck in its current authoritarian trajectory if it can't fully admit to the historical truth and continues on this path of denial? What do you think? Well, I think that these uh, memory wars are a great challenge for, for all societies. But if I can refer to this, uh, to this question, about um, someone who asked the question um, has this feeling that in, in the United States, the, the memory of, of, of the war is, is completely different. So what is interesting in, in Central Eastern Europe and Russia is that, that the Second World War for so many reasons, is like, it's a crucial event, like a turning point in our histories. And the, this, this clash, this debate is, is about memory is, and is about how our nations remember the war. And it's very, very important, as I mentioned before, uh, there was a group of Polish and Russian historians. They even published a few volumes about, uh, um, about common history, about World War II. Um, and it's, it's very important to, to find, um, like Poland did with Germany, we published uh, several textbooks on, on Polish-German history, on, on World War II history, where, in which uh, both Polish and German historians were trying to present just the truth, just present the facts. So I am um, dreaming about this moment when uh, Polish, Russian, and Ukrainian historians will be able to publish uh, textbooks for high school students, um, for university students uh, about World War II history, even emphasizing some differences in, in points of view, because 
every nation has a different point of view and for unlike unlike uh, the United States, I believe, or in the United States, it's it's very different. The the World War II memory is 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 different because uh, the war did not take place on this territory, but it did take place on Ukrainian, Russian, Polish territory. So so my point is that um, we have this unfortunate moment of of clashing narratives and uh, and memory wars. Uh, I hope that there will be a moment in five years, 10 years, maybe 15 years, when uh, Russians, Ukrainian and, and, and Polish and Lithuanian historians may be able to, to write a joint textbook uh, as Germans and Poles did. Thank you, Ambassador Wilczek. Just for a second, let me stay with you because there's a question from the audience that's specific to Poland. Um, and the question is, uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact included significant territorial annexations of Polish territory and their incorporation into Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. Is this an issue in your, this is continue to be an issue in modern relations between Poland and those countries? It's not an issue now. It was, of course, an issue in 1940s. I've just read a very long memoir of one of my predecessors, Polish ambassador to Washington, Jan Ciechanowski, who in detail was describing uh, all these dramatic conversations, negotiations he and the Polish government had with the Americans and the Russians in 1943-44, when half of the Polish territory, you know, 13 million people were supposed to be um, given to 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 the soviet union and for for many and this moment when also western powers uh were pushing poland to go to into this compromise so this this change of borders uh in in 1944 45 and uh, the, the the whole situation with with moving to the west with poland uh getting uh, former German territories. It was a very painful process in 1940s and 50s. But today, um, I think there are no real issues with, with um, Eastern European countries and with Germany about this post-war post order. It, it just happened. Um, fortunately, uh, countries like Poland, Lithuania, and Estonia, and, and others are in, in the European Union. So the EU membership also changed a lot. And I don't think this is any longer an issue in, in Poland or in our neighboring countries. Thank you, Ambassadors. Uh, just uh, with a few minutes left in our uh, time together, Ambassador Yelchenko, uh, Ukraine has been mentioned by your, your colleagues. Uh, by everyone uh, really in this conversation. Um, and there's also a question uh, from the audience. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to anything Ambassadors Vilcek or Krishnas have said um, and to consider the following question. Um, how effective do you think Russian propaganda has been in disseminating the myth that Russians and Ukrainians and to a certain extent Belarusians are one single nation? Um, have you seen uh, perhaps Western politicians uh, repeating this narrative and, and thereby legitimizing it? Or do you think it's de facto been uh, ineffective? I would say that it uh, is being ineffective. I haven't heard much about that in the West. Uh, probably it, it works quite well in some more distant countries. For example, uh, well, let me once again go back to my UN past and say that when, when we talk, for example, with African colleagues, with many African countries, and they constitute the vast majority in the UN, 52, even 53 countries. So much, much depends when it comes to any vote on, on any decision in the UN. And uh, when we talk with them about the Russian aggression against Ukraine or Russian-Ukrainian conflict, uh, uh, they would always say that, look, uh, we're far away from you, but uh, we like the times when there was a uh, one powerful Soviet Union and you should, you know, sort out 
your problems between you know two of you. We don't like that you are different. We like more when you were you know one country. So this is the narrative which you hear in the UN from many many Africans and 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 some distant Asian countries or some islands in the Pacific. So it, you know for them this narrative may work, but it doesn't work really in the West. People are uh, you know educated enough to to make distinctions to make a difference. Uh, I would also fully support what my my Polish colleague has said about his dream about the joint textbook. I have the same dream because actually uh, we may have uh, uh, different opinions and views over the past, but we should not really have differences over the future. And uh, the sooner we come to that point, the better. We can see right now during this uh, you know, coronavirus times how much the world is globalized and, and uh, how much we are dependent on each other. And I think this is the time to, to think it over. Once again, coming back to the lessons of the, of, of the Second World War. Uh, yes, of course, we should honor the victims be them, you know, Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, Lithuanians, Americans, any other nation. But we should really make some more effort uh, trying to uh, fight the falsifications, the, the, the fake narratives, which, which do not bring our people closer to each other and which are uh, not helpful in our striving to have uh, you know, more, more peace and prosperity in our countries. Thank you, Ambassador Yolchenko. Um, I'm afraid with that, we are running out of time. I want to end on, on this note of optimism that, of course, the positive narrative around uh, World War II and the 75th, 75th anniversary that we celebrate today um, is the struggle and the victory that your countries, Ukraine, Lithuania, Poland, were able to achieve um, in the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89 and the dissolution of the Soviet Union that followed, uh, that freed so many individuals, uh, millions of people uh, from uh, Soviet aggression and occupation. And I think at these moments, uh, these difficult moments that we're living through today, where we see authoritarianism on the rise across the world, certainly in Russia, China and elsewhere is a moment to remember uh, that that struggle was long and it was painful, but it led to an incredible uh, moment of euphoria and freedom. And we see the consequences of that today in the transatlantic relationship um, and the strength of democratic values and principles as an appealing way to live for the majority of people across the world. Uh, so thank you so much ambassadors uh, Ambassador Yelchenko, Ambassador Vilcek, uh, Ambassador Krishunas, uh, for joining for this conversation. Thank you, those of you who tuned in uh, from all over the world and, and gave us some excellent questions. Um, I look forward to continue the discussion um, and thank you very, very much for this enlightening conversation today. Goodbye.